Good afternoon and good morning to our West Coast listeners and happy 4th of July holiday week. Hope everyone had a restful and wonderful 4th of July and welcome to our weekly chair chat. My name is Juan Thomas, chair of the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice section. And I'm so excited today to have as our special guest, Mr. Peter Canellis, who is the author of The Great Dissenter, the life story of Justice John Marshall Harlan. Peter is the um, editorial, former, former um, editorial page editor for the Boston Globe and the executive director of Politico. He's the editor of New York Times bestseller, The Last Lion, The Fall and Rise of Ted Kennedy. Peter, so glad to have you today. Welcome. Thank you so much, Juan. It's great to be here. And it's good to see you again. Peter, let me first start by asking you, um, who was John Marshall Harlan? John Marshall Harlan uh, was, well, there are two John Marshall Harlans who served on the Supreme Court. One, this is the father, the, uh, the grandfather, the original John Marshall Harlan. Uh, he was um, a man from Kentucky. Uh, he was a man who fought in the Civil War. Uh, he became a uh, Supreme Court Justice in 1877 at a crucial moment when the Constitution was being reinterpreted in light of the new amendments that came about after the Civil War. He was unlike all of his fellow justices on the bench in terms of his background, in terms of his uh, legal experience, in terms of the part of the country that he came from. Uh, but as was proven over his 34 year career, he was also different from them in the way that he viewed the law. In the two most important areas, I think, uh, that uh, of the law that was uh, adjudicated during his time on the court, that is to say civil rights, and then also the ability of Congress and legislatures to address the tremendous economic inequities of that period, the Gilded Age, was also a period of massive immigration and a uh, lot, you know, tremendous income inequality. Um, on those two issues, civil rights and income inequality, he sketched out a dramatically different interpretation of the Constitution, especially the post-Civil War amendments, than all of his colleagues. And the irony is today, Harlan's views are the law, not the views of the majority. So Harlan's career is unique, I think, in American Supreme Court history in that you have to look at it and ask, what, what was it that enabled this one man to see the law so differently than everybody else in positions of power in society and in uh, uh, on his court? Uh, and so his lifestyle, his life story, and uh, the, the values and experiences that shaped him become a, a really important part of that, uh, uh, of how we answer that question. Well, I'm glad you touched on his life story. And I really want to encourage our listeners to buy your book, The Great Dissenter. <laughs> um, I have it right here. Um, it's a great, great read. And you really delve into his life story, how he grew up, his family. Let's talk a little bit about Justice Harlan's family. Uh, particularly, I'd love to hear your perspective on his father and their relationship, you know, father to son, but also with his brother, Robert Harlan. Let's, and then we'll also talk about um, his daughter, Edith, a little bit later. Go ahead. Yes, well, obviously, family was central in his life. His father, James Harlan, was uh, pretty much the leading attorney in Kentucky and had been the state attorney general at various points. He was also the U.S. attorney from Kentucky at one point. Uh, but his dream uh, was to create uh, a family law firm and to and to have like uh, all of his children, uh, all of his sons uh, join him in the law. Uh, he was a strong believer in the law. The name John Marshall Harlan came from the great Chief Justice John Marshall. Right. And that wasn't an accident. It's because people in Kentucky and the Harlan family in particular um, were living on the precipice during the years of uh, John Marshall Harlan's upbringing. He was born in 1833. And from that period, until the Civil War, everyone in Kentucky in positions of power was aware that there was this 
tremendous national controversy and crisis and dispute that was brewing around them. And they felt that they would be the losers, that their state would be the battleground if there was ever a civil war. They also knew that the civic fabric of their state would be torn apart because they were mm. half uh, slave owning supporters of the South. The other half were uh, uh, free market supporting Northerners. And uh, they felt that the, the you know, very uh, ground that they stood on was gonna be destroyed by this uh, pending war. So all of the leaders of Kentucky that had any sort of national aspirations inspired by Henry Clay, who was the greatest politician of his era in Kentucky, they tried to come up with a series of compromises that would forestall the crisis. The Harlands and Clay were involved, for example, in the colonization movement, which was pretty disastrous at the time, but in, you know, it tended to sort of relieve pressure by um, uh, having enslaved peoples move to Liberia and create a colony in Africa. Uh, they talked about geographical balance in politics. That was a prime focus of Henry Clay and James Harlan, sort of creating a political lever where, which would enable the free states to remain free and the slave states to feel some degree of security uh, in their own uh, ability to perpetuate slavery. Um, these were all uncomfortable compromises. There was talk of maybe compensating slave owners in places where slavery was, was abolished. Um, I think that people in that situation felt that politics were uh, a threat to them, and they looked to the law to have a higher solution. And John Marshall was the man who asserted judicial review, who said that you know the Supreme Court and not Congress would interpret the Constitution. I think that was some of the mindset that was uh, instilled in, in John Marshall Harlan from his father. It was like, belief in the American institutions, but a belief most of all in the power of the law over politics and the rights that are there in the Supreme, uh, in the uh, Constitution and that were articulated in the Declaration of Independence and enforced by the Supreme Court, you know, somewhere in there is the solution to this national crisis. I think he also uh, felt that whatever the family's feelings about the institution of slavery, and there's some evidence that James Harlan, the father, was very skeptical of slavery, as was Henry Clay, even though they themselves were slave owners, with a little bit of an irony there, uh, they were skeptical of the institution, um, but, uh, but they were very fearful that the whole uh, American experiment, which they saw as like the great hope for mankind was gonna be destroyed by this issue. Robert Harlan was an interesting figure in the middle of this. Robert Harlan was somebody who came to live with James Harlan, John's father, when he was eight years old at the moment when James was just uh, marrying John's mother. And we know from later accounts, uh, because Robert Harlan himself became a famous man, well known, and there are many stories written about him in his lifetime. We know that when he was eight years old, he and his mother came from Southern Virginia, from a county where James Harlan's own mother had come from, and made the 450 mile trek to Kentucky to find his father. And we know that eight year old Robert ended up living with James Harlan, which created the presumption at the time that he was the father. There was some thought that maybe his own, James's own father who had died in the interim may have been uh, Robert's father as well, but Robert was presumed to be James's son. We don't know much about the whole, you know, legal side of this transaction, but we know that Robert was living with James Harlan and treated more as a family member than as an enslaved person. He was living in the main house with James and his wife. He was educated at home by James. There's a famous story there that James tried to enroll him in school, but he was rejected for being black at the time. And, uh, so James insisted on, on homeschooling him instead. And for the rest of his life, Robert Harlan, you know, again, who became a wealthy, well-known man and an advocate for education, always like joked about having had a half a day's schooling himself. Now, Robert Harlan had this unusual place in the family, even though it was 
reported in papers and rumor now that he was the the son of James Harlan. So John Marshall Harlan, uh, who was one of nine children that uh, James and his wife Eliza had, you know, had to wonder about Robert, this young man growing up in their house who was older and was sort of more like a kind of half generation older brother, sort of uh, uh, an uncle figure who was leading this very different life from men. John Marshall Highland always remembered his childhood as being one of like relentless study, that the father was this sort of forbidding figure who, who tried to train the boys in the law and who uh, tried to discipline them very harshly. And they, they loved and respected their father, but they rarely talked to their father. He was a, he was a, a sort of figure, a role model more than a, a presence in their life. Whereas when Robert Harlan would talk about James Harlan, it was a it was a more dynamic relationship. Robert Harlan also, despite being homeschooled and perhaps because he could not go to uh, a pu regular public school, he devised many ways to participate in the economy of Kentucky even while technically being enslaved and legally being enslaved. The first he opportunity that he found was in horse racing. Uh, he became a real horse racing pioneer in Kentucky and continued to be uh, a noted and respected horseman throughout his entire life. In those days, um, horse racing was an opportunity for black people. They used to talk about the early racing meets as being like a checkerboard, you know, uh, of right. black and white people together. Uh, he then, uh, traveled to the gold rush uh, and was one of the first people in from Kentucky in 1849 and into the beginning of 1850 to come to uh, San Francisco, making the sort of perilous journey through Panama and all that, and came back with enough gold that would be worth in today's dollar six million dollars. Robert then moved to Cincinnati uh, funded black owned businesses. This was then at a time when Cincinnati was the terminus of the Underground Railroad. These businesses were as simple as uh, grocery and as as pioneering as a photography studio where some of the American uh, photographic pioneers who are also African Americans right. like perfected their craft. So later in life, they developed a relationship. John and Robert Harlan continued to have a sort of family feeling as Robert, living in Ohio, became the leading Black politician in Ohio. And uh, they played, uh, Robert Robert even played a, a role in helping to promote John Harlan uh, for the Supreme Court. And we can talk about that separately if you want, but, but that's, yeah. a, that's a taste of his relationship with his father and his brother Robert. So you speak um, and you wrote very passionately about the role his family played um, in his life. He was, a, he was a family man. He had, you know, several kids. Um, his daughter, Edith, who passed away, was kind of the heart of the family. Could you speak to what you believe his family's role or impact had on his judicial decisions on the Supreme Court? Do you think there was a connection between his family and how he viewed and how he ruled on certain cases, particularly, you know, in the Plessy v. Ferguson decision and other civil rights cases. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think it's it's a combination of his family and the place that he was in the country. And I think some of the factors that 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 bore on him is at his time on the court, he was a um, the only justice who had personal relationships with black people. Most notably, you have Robert Harlan, right? But he also was close to Frederick Douglass. He also, when he would go back to Kentucky, would meet with African-American lawyers. So he, um, he came from a society in which black people were present. M many of the uh, other justices who ironically had what was presumed when they were put on the court, a better civil rights record, because remember, John Harlan was pushing these compromises before the Civil War. He was not an abolitionist. And uh, the other justices serving on the court were abolitionists. They were Northerners. But of course, you know, if you were living in New York or Boston, or even some of them moved to Chicago, one moved to California, uh, you could be an abolitionist without paying any sort of a political cost. It was a very different situation there in, in Kentucky. But when he went on the court, you know, Harlan was presumed to be the, the court Southerner, you know, the sort of the more reluctant figure on civil rights. In fact, he was the person who actually knew and understood 
Black people because of that family. So that's one strain. Another strain is that belief in what a lot of people, particularly conservatives today, would call uh, American exceptionalism. You know, that mm -hmm. sense from his father that this system of, of rights that were there in the Constitution is what distinguishes the United States from every other country in the world, which mm -hmm. at that time were they were ruled by despots. They were ruled by kings and emperors and popes and whether other figures. Right. And uh, the, the rights are what made Americans Americans. Now, obviously, he came to believe, especially after fighting in the Civil War, seeing death and all that, that the failure to secure rights for all people, to make good the promise in the uh, Declaration of Independence of the equality of man, was a flaw in the Constitution that was uh, painfully uh, solved by the resolve by the Civil War. That's a path that Abraham Lincoln also went on. Abraham Lincoln, who also had some Kentucky roots and was also an admirer of Henry Clay. So John Marshall Harlan, when he con he's confronted with these cases like Pussy v. Ferguson or the civil rights cases of 1883, other race related cases, the other justices you know, beneficiaries of the Northern economic boom kind of wanted to promote peace and harmony over justice. It was like, they just didn't want to be fighting race wars uh, and they didn't want to be punishing the South anymore. They felt like things needed to be on a, a normal base. The South would never accept black people as equals. So they enacted a series of uh, Supreme Court decisions that had the effect of depriving African-Americans of full citizenship. John Harlan saw this passionately as the old poison coming back. He felt like, you know, the whole civil war had been fought to resolve this flaw in the constitution. And mm -hmm. here were these justices that he's sitting on the court restoring that flaw. Some of the things that influenced, I think, some of these Northerners were notions of racial superiority or a more gentle version that sort of said that formerly enslaved people were, you know, they were held in a, 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 a reduced state in, in slavery and that it's going to take them a lot of time to reach a true position of equality. John Harlan knew the fallacy in that because he'd watched Robert Harlan grow up and become the richest member of the family and the most uh, successful and prominent one, perhaps other than himself when he went joined the Supreme Court. And so he knew that when black people had their rights protected, that that was a key ingredient to their success and depriving them of that what was what would hold them back. It was sort of the inverse of what many of the Northern justices were thinking. So his family played many different roles. He also was a very deeply religious man and came to believe that there was a connection between his religion and his concept of uh, the equality of man. His daughter, who you mentioned, who died tragically at 26, you know, one of her passions had been teaching uh, uh, children who were the sons and daughters of formerly enslaved people, uh, teaching them to write and read and advance in society. And when she died, he, he pledged his life to, to uh, perpetuating her values that he, he, that he so cherished. And it happened that she died just before his big break with his Supreme Court colleagues, which was in the civil rights cases of 1883. Right. Speaking of 1883, let's talk about the Civil Rights Act of 1883 in that case specifically. He dissented in that case, and he really jumped on a line that um, I read where I think the Justice Brady, was it? Or, or Justice said, Bradley, I think, wrote. Yeah. Bradley, Bradley, right. He said, special favor of the law. Can you explain what that phrase means and Justice Harlan's response to that? Well, unlike, unlike Pussy v. Ferguson, which I think we'll discuss at another point, uh, the yeah. civil rights cases of 1883 had many differences. For one thing, unlike Pussy v. Ferguson, almost no one was paying attention to like Pussy v. Ferguson outside of the Black community. In, uh, in, in the civil rights case of 1883, it was sort of a national referendum on civil rights. Uh, the uh, U.S. Congress and President Grant had actually produced a federal civil rights act that guaranteed black people uh, equality in uh, com public accommodations and transportation and the sort of rudiments yeah. of uh, commercial life in the United States. But in uh, places all around the country, including in the North and the South, there were individual business owners and think people like 
you know, railroad porters and ticket takers who at theaters who refuse to serve black people equally, you know, move them to the balcony or whatever things, things that were uh, terrible. There were, there was a case involving a hotel in Jefferson city where even a, a black person who was a uh, Missouri state representative was denied uh, access to the hotel. So they pile, put all these cases together in one civil rights challenge um, and at that time, there was a feeling on the court, on the Supreme Court, that unanimity was very, very important. Uh, the whole country was watching. It was front page news. Uh, galleries were packed when the case was argued. And there was a plausible legal theory uh, uh, that, that was against the Civil Rights Act of, of 1875. Plausible in the sense that all the court had to do to rule it invalid would be to say that the Constitution does not apply to private conduct. It only applies to states uh, and that state action is therefore required in order to um, justify a civil rights, a civil rights act. So the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which touched on uh, all of these areas, transportation and restaurants and inns and things like that, uh, it was too granular for the federal government. The federal government could only uh, uh, punish states. So Justice Bradley, who was a sort of pool-thinking uh, New Yorker uh, and a corporate attorney wrote a very bloodless uh, majority opinion that sort of said this, but he included one killer line, which was, there must come a time in the evolution of any uh, race where they take the ranks of mere citizen and not the special favorite of the law. Here he's referring to African-Americans at a time in 1883, when lynchings were at a record high and were rising and the right. Ku Klux Klan was controlling many rural areas of America, he's declaring black people to be the special favorite of the law. Harlan in his 1883 dissent had to face many, many interesting obstacles. One was getting over the hurdle of dissenting at all at a time when all the pressure was with him to join the majority and he was not a dissenter on the court before that. But he decided to make this break. It was shortly after his daughter died. It was, I think, in his mind was the sense that, for one thing, he had always blamed the Dred Scott decision with helping to to perpetuate, you know, perpetuate the forces that uh, advanced the Civil War. Uh, he it, he had this heightened sense of when the Supreme Court gets something wrong, people can die. <laughs> you know, he saw the death in, in the Civil War. He knew people like Robert Harlan. He knew people like Frederick Douglass. He knew the extent to which the Black community depended on these rights and to which he believed that having an equal playing field was crucial to uh, the advancement of the United States for all citizens, for white people as well as Black people. So, he knew at one crucial point that he was willing to break with all of his colleagues on this, the most important case that they had confronted. He also had to get over that, that state action argument and find arguments that would you know, refute that. And he also had to sort of articulate a sense of where the boundaries were in these brand new amendments that had been added to the court. So his dissent in the civil rights case of 1883 was long, it was thoughtful. There's a story about how he was sitting up in the uh, study in this home on Massachusetts Avenue in, in Washington uh, in this the throes of grief over his daughter's death and struggling with his dissent. And his wife brought him up this, this inkwell that he had saved as a, uh, a, a piece of Supreme Court history, which was the inkwell that Chief Justice Tawney had used to write the Dred Scott opinion. And mm. just putting the inkwell there on the table, like reminded Justice Harlan of the stakes here in this decision and sort of the pen started flowing in his wife's, wife's view. So he took direct, uh, uh, a direct shot at Justice Bradley's line about the special favorites of the law, saying it is scarcely just to say that Black people have been the special favorite of the laws. He then talked about the issue of state action and pointed out that the whole purpose of the post-Civil War amendments Part of the, you know, the the original intent of the amendments, as articulated by the uh, members of Congress who were approving them, was to make legal a predecessor civil rights law from 1866, 
that had been thought to be on sort of dubious constitutional grounds. So the entire 14th and 13th and 14th Amendments, both of the 13th and 14th Amendments came about out of an effort to give the federal government the power to enforce civil rights. And here was just Bradley taking it away. He also was pointing out many innovative legal theories, such as pointing out that you know within the common law, there had been a belief that state action was imputed in, in things that were part of the stream of commerce, like transportation, like being the only hotel or the only restaurant in town. And that theory eventually took hold, you know, decades and decades later. He also introduced the idea that civil rights, uh, civil rights law could be supported by the Commerce Clause, which again became the grounds, you know, um, um, 80 years later to approve a successor uh, Civil Rights Act. So I think his uh, dissent in the civil rights case of 1883 wasn't the sort of soaring piece of rhetoric that his dissent in Plessy for Ferguson was. But it was a very notable uh, and thoughtful uh, and articulate description of what, what the 14th Amendment and the 13th Amendment also were sort of trying to do in the Constitution. And that one that has his dissent has, has stood the test of time and his legal views have stood the test of time. Here, one of the theme, the theme for this year for our civil rights and social justice section for the American Bar Association has centered around economic justice. And we've been raising the economic justice question in the context of all of our other broader civil rights issues. You alluded to and touched on some of the economic justice issues that Harlan dealt with in his day, but could you dig a little deeper into some of the cases that you think speak to the economic injustices of that time and how Harlan responded to them? Yeah, I think that during that time, there was, uh, uh, you know, a real sense that uh, capitalism was under siege among the rich, right? And the right. other justices who tended to be mm. northern corporate attorneys and themselves very rich, Harlan struggled with money all of his life, but the other justices were very well off on the court from their legal careers. Um, there were a series of decisions in which uh, Congress actually did, you know, step up to try to address economic inequality and the Supreme Court shot them down. So the first was uh, a case called EC9. It was, and it was about the Sherman Antitrust Act. Uh, Congress stepped up, passed a bill that gave the federal government the power to break up these monopolies that were setting wages and prices, particularly in the what was then called, a, called the Western part of the country, including Kentucky, where Harlan was from. And um, there was a a very sort of low hanging fruit case involving the sugar trust. 98% of sugar production in the United States was controlled by one trust that had, you know, very purposefully combined all the manufacturers into, into one company, essentially, that was setting wages and prices. The court, shockingly, declared the entire Sherman Antitrust Act unconstitutional on the grounds that a manufacturing monopoly is not the same thing as a consumer monopoly and that the federal government hadn't proven the case properly. Harlan, again, was a sole dissenter in this case and mm. took on the issue squarely by saying, you know, that the court was proceeding on entirely too narrow grounds in this case. That is actually the one example of a case where Harlan was able to change the minds of other justices and other, you know, factors, I'm sure, contributed to it. But the court in its in his lifetime changed its mind on antitrust uh, prosecutions. But it took a good number of years. But Harlan, right. again, as a sole dissenter, was way ahead of the curve on that. Then you had the income tax. Then there had been an income tax that funded the Civil War, mm -hmm. brought the income tax back it was much fairer than the tariff system, which put the same duty on any piece of imported coffee or raw material, uh, the same duty the rich had to pay and the poor. We're not talking about the same percentage. We're talking about the same penny, you know, rich and poor. And it was seen as, as a real engine of inequality, the tariff system uh, funding the government, which was becoming bigger at that time. So an income tax was thought to be much fairer. And on very questionable grounds, a five to four majority of the Supreme Court declared the income tax unconstitutional. Of the four dissenters, Harlan was by far the most uh, forthright. And his dissent was eventually read 
allowed, you know, 16 years later in the House of Representatives as, as part of the political movement to try to pass a constitutional amendment to overrule that case, and it was overruled. We also had the famous case of Lochner v. New York, which was where state mm -hmm. legislatures had stepped in to try to pass minimum wage laws and minimum hour laws for the safety of workers. In the Lochner case, it was bakery workers who were often being forced to work overnight and to, to sleep on the same tables where they were kneading bread. And so as a health and safety rule, they limited the hours to 60 per week that, the gov that employers could force workers to work. Um, and uh, the Supreme Court unveiling their uh, 14th Amendment theory that the 14th Amendment liberty language, of course, the same liberty language that was used to justify Roe v. Wade many years later, that that liberty language enforced a right to contract, which uh, allowed people to contract for their labor freely and therefore precluded all health and safety, uh, or not all health and safety legislation, but all legislation that was aimed at uh, uh, preserving labor peace, protecting workers in various ways. And it set an extremely high bar for a self and uh, for a sort of uh, police powers action by a state. There were that same right to contract had the effect in the Lochner case of knocking out things like minimum wage laws for, mm -hmm. for women and other things in later years. Uh, you know, examples of where state legislatures tried to reduce inequality. In all of those cases, just like in all the race cases, Harlan's view has prevailed over time. You know, there are some people today, uh, some conservatives today will say, well, there may have been a way you could have gotten to the Lochner result through the Privileges and Immunities Clause and things like that. But even most conservatives would say the Lochner case was wrongly decided and that Harlan's dissent was appropriate in that case. Uh, we have the income tax today thanks to the 16th Amendment to the Constitution, and we, uh, uh, which overruled it, and we have antitrust protection thanks to the Supreme Court itself changing its mind. Right. That is wonderful history that people should um, be aware of, and I, I really appreciate you highlighting some of those cases. As we begin to wrap up, there's two cases I want to ask you about, because uh, I think most people don't know about either one of them from a historical perspective. First is the Ed Johnson case. Could you talk about that case and tell us a bit about that? You you discussed, I heard you talk about that in person a few months ago, and I wanted to have you share that story again. Well, it's an amazing story. It's a, it's a bit of a long story here, and we're going to go a little over in our time, but I'll try to give you That's the fine. shorter shorter version of this. It was a... Uh, a terrible lynching case in, in Chattanooga. Uh, it was the proverbial case where um, a very young white woman had been attacked in a cemetery. At first, she had not even uh, identified the race of her attacker. At a certain point, it became uh, known that a black person was uh, was suspected. The sheriff, uh, there were there were rewards put out and all that on very very flimsy ground. The sheriff arrested somebody who had multiple witnesses who were able to uh, to place him somewhere else at the time of the crime. Uh, there was an immediate sort of fervid atmosphere in Chattanooga where white mobs would be storming the jail, thinking that this uh, person was uh, being held there, this suspect was being held there and almost breaking down the doors to the jail until the judge from the case came out and like promised to put this case first on the docket and actually promised a conviction uh, to the mob. Uh, they had a, a quick case, and even though the uh, defendant, Ed Johnson, uh, had a, a competent attorney, there were multiple decisions by the judge that were, uh, you know, uh, it would, by today's standards especially, make it a travesty of justice. Uh, the defendant never identified him firmly. There was a moment on the stand where she was on the stand, uh, and they had brought her back a second time, and the prosecutor was saying to her, in the eyes of God, can you say that this was the man that attacked you? And she hesitated. She said, well, you know, his voice sounds like the man. I, I don't know. I, can, don't, I can't say this. At that moment, a juror stands up, all white men in the jury, stands up and says, I'm going to kill him now. And so he tries to lunge at Ed Johnson, the defendant, and the judge doesn't even excuse that juror. So after this terrible trial and the uh, defendant is uh, 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 sentenced to be hung, 
A black attorney, Noah Pardon, travels by train up to Washington, knowing that the sins is going to be carried out in a matter of a couple of days. Uh, everybody says there's no hope of getting any kind of relief here. The Supreme Court has completely turned its back on state court procedures in the South particularly, but around the country anyway, that were deeply uh, injurious to black defendants particularly, but also the poor whites and other uh, people who were deemed uh, victims or deemed uh, undesirable in society uh, to the power structure there. Uh, so Pardon makes this trip and with no sleep, you know, shows up at Harlan's house because Harlan is the justice on the court who oversees the circuit that includes Tennessee. And uh, I think that Harlan had had in his mind that he wanted an opportunity to call attention to the tremendous injustices being done in state courts in the South. And so he, after hearing the evidence, grants a stay of execution and, and uh, promises a Supreme Court review. When the word of that decision gets back to Tennessee, it is like, throwing gasoline on, a, on an already roaring fire. Mm -hmm. Everyone, the media, the preachers, the pulpit in the white community starts uh, 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 venting about this and about the federal institute, the federal intrusion, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, 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 the failure to allow Chattanooga to keep its own streets safe. Uh, there were a few uh, white people on the other side, but the record is pretty bad, it's just said for Chattanooga. And then that night after the, the Harlan's decision had gotten, gotten uh, digested in the community, the sheriff uh, left one 74-year-old uh, night watchman guarding the jail. This is a jail that had already been attacked several weeks earlier, left only, only one person uh, judging uh, there to protect the, the, uh, the jail, left, gave everyone else the night off. Uh, and a mob came, took Ed Johnson, carried him all the way to the Walnut Street Bridge, which was the leading you know, site in town, right. uh, lynched him. They put a sign on him saying, you know, Judge Harlan, come get your, you know, N-word now. It was a wow. horrible uh, chain of events. Harlan then rallied the Supreme Court uh, with the help of other justices, including Oliver Wendell Holmes, to try to take action because in protecting the prisoner, the sheriff had actually become like a, a quasi-federal official. You know, he had become a federal prisoner at that point. So at that point, they had no FBI. They had no one to even handle it. So the Secret Service agents were redeployed from Theodore Roosevelt's personal detail to go down to Chattanooga and do some research into this. Long story short, the Supreme Court serves as a jury trial for the first and, and only time in its history. Uh, they're a trial court. Uh, with the justices serving as the jury, and they find the sheriff and other leaders of the community guilty uh, of um, uh, violating the civil rights of, of Ed Johnson or violating the federal rights of Ed Johnson. Um, it was a very noteworthy trial. There are many interesting facets of it, but I think that its greatest legacy over time uh, actually, it has many legacies over time, even though people don't really understand this. People don't know about this case. It isn't taught that much. Right. Right. Thurgood Marshall said it was the first time Black people actually saw the Supreme Court acting in their favor, uh, which was an interesting comment by him. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people feel that the holding of the sheriff accountable may have constrained uh, some of the uh, state officials in the South in the civil rights movement of the middle 20th century. So it may have had some effect there. But I think the greatest effect is that it established a record. It showed all of the forces that combined to make this lynching uh, uh, a reality. Uh, in many places in the South, when there were hundreds of lynchings per year, it was always attributed to the Klan, to these faceless guys, to the, you know, the riffraff did it. Uh, this record showed that it was the leaders of the Chattanooga community did it. And because this, it's an unambiguous story, Chattanooga has been able to come together now and honor the Ed Johnson leg uh, legacy with a um, multiracial coalition that came together to create a monument uh, right at the Walnut Street Bridge to Ed Johnson's life and also has a major plaque honoring Harlan 
uh, for his role in the situation. Peter, you're telling that story reminds me of the importance of us knowing our history and people learning history, particularly students in schools. So I want to thank you for sharing that, that legacy. Um, we're out of time, unfortunately. I wanted to ask you about the Jacobson case, but people need to read the book about that. I want to ask you in conclusion, what would you say is Justice Harlan's legacy that we as lawyers, law students, and members of the judiciary should know and think about in the context of our future and our democracy, and as we just have come off a 4th of July um, Independence Day holiday? Well, I would say that it, uh, Harlan's greatest legacy at this moment is his dissent in Plessy, which we have touched on at various points, but where he included these iconic phrases like the Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor cla tolerates classes among citizens. Uh, the humblest is the peer of the most powerful. There is no caste here. Uh, at a crucial moment in history, he was reminding America of the stakes, uh, that when the Supreme Court gets something wrong, when the Supreme Court denies people rights, he was predicting disaster for all Americans, for black and white Americans, for everybody. He was the only person who predicted a lot of the, the racial anguish that we are still feeling today in society because of the legacy of segregation. He was the only person who understood that Plessy v. Ferguson, this little known case, uh, was going to give the legal imprimatur of the Constitution to segregation and, and create this all the agonies that, that ended up resulting in it. And at this crucial moment, he, I think, maintained faith in the legal system for future generations, including largely future generations of Black people like Thurgood Marshall, who considered Harlan a hero. And you have to imagine what would it have been like if the entire white judiciary and the entire white community turned against the entire black community at that moment? You know, would hope have survived at that moment? And when Thurgood Marshall was planning the cases that led to Brown versus Board and the, the heart of the 20th century civil rights movement, he used Harlan's dissent in Plessy v. Ferguson as what Constance Baker Motley called his Bible, that he would read aloud out from Harlan's dissent. He used it as a way of persuading plaintiffs in the face of you know, Klan threats and violence to sort of stand up to try to assert, assert equal rights on the belief that white judges might, it might possibly be that white judges could see the law through the eyes of black people the way that Harlan did and because Harlan did. So that's his unique legacy. And it's a good thought for us to have on this Independence Day weekend. Harlan was a deep believer in the, the special uh, destiny of the United States. He was a deep believer in the Constitution, but he also knew through hard experience that you really have to fight to maintain those uh, those values and those rights that, that, that he held so dear and that we should hold so dear. Peter Canellis, author of The Great Dissenter, the story of Justice John Marshall Hallin. Please pick up this great book. It's a must read, particularly for students of history, law students, and all those who want to understand the complete story of our great democracy. Peter, thank you for being my guest today. Have a great week and good to see you again. Thank you so much, Juan. Thank you. Thank you.